Bruce, take it away. Uh, okay, hopefully uh, people are hearing me okay. That's apparently has pretty good microphone. Anyway, I'm going to be talking about things that didn't work. And uh, all of us have made things that didn't work. And usually people don't want to present things that didn't work. It's kind of embarrassing to say, hey, I built something and it just didn't work worth a darn, you know. So anyway, I'm going to just talk about things that didn't work and, uh, you know, hopefully what I learned from them and uh, stuff like that. So uh, anyway, let's see. There's space bar. All right. First, I had a... Uh, oops. It was space bar. There we go. There we go. Uh, so there was a partial eclipse coming across South Carolina where I live, and I had the local museum, uh, the astronomy club there said, hey, maybe you can set up a radio telescope for that thing. This was uh, October of last year. But anyway, so I said, you know, kind of agreed to that. And uh, turned up, this didn't uh, work real well. I had, you know, a lot of planning, finding places to set up and, uh, you know, went through a bunch of, uh, you know, problems there and uh, basically nothing worked. So I went and got the map of the museum off of Google Maps, turned it to picture mode and took a look and said, okay, if I... Yeah, set up my equipment, uh, you know, right along that red line there that I'll uh, be in the point where there's no trees in the way. You know, I carefully, you know, spent a few hours planning that with, uh, you know, compass, protractor, and other such things to determine that, you know, if I, you know, set up anywhere along there, I won't have any trees or anything in the way, so I should have a successful observation. And then uh, it came up that it was going to be a cloudy day. And I thought, well, I've been finding the sun by, uh, uh, you know, using a shadow. You can see on the uh, picture on the, uh, does this have the uh, little uh, yeah, laser sure. pointer thing on it? Oh, yeah. Laser. Okay, that, and that'll just go with this. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so anyway, I was originally, uh, uh, the, that screw head sticking up right there, the shadow of it on the upper edge of this would lead me pointed at the sun. Well, if there's clouds, you can't use the shadow graph. But I figured, well, you know, 12 gigahertz signal, that would be enough going through the clouds. Very little loss at that uh, frequency. So I got angle finder here that I put on there, built up a setting circle down there. And so once the setting circles are set up, now I can successfully find the sun despite having, uh, you know, clouds of the way. I thought... Yeah, that ought to work good. And then uh, uh, after a, a little bit of, uh, you know, testing, I said, well, hold on, things aren't working, you know. I'm, uh, you know, just seeing to have garbage coming out of my uh, receiver there. So took a look at the satellite belt because the 12 gigahertz satellite, uh, you know, the receiver being used as a uh, radio telescope, well, you're sharing a frequency that belongs to somebody else, so interference is yours. Well, anyway, it was less than two degrees between the path of the uh, sun across, yeah, excuse me, the path of the sun across, uh, yeah, the sun. that's the satellite path. This is the path of the sun, and they're two degrees apart, and I stopped plotting uh, positions of satellites after I, you know, just looking up various uh, positions of them for uh, satellite installers, but there were satellites all across there. Trying to move the thing across on my, you know, test a couple of days earlier, uh, you know, you could find satellites and the satellites are enough stronger that you really couldn't, uh, you know, see the sun at all hardly. And I just hooked the output. I have one of the old 141T spectrum analyzers, a piece of, uh, you know, ancient history. But anyway, I hooked it up to the output there. And that's typically what I saw. And that level was uh, 10 to 15 dB stronger than the uh, increase I saw from the sun. So it says two degrees apart on a, uh, you know, half meter dish is definitely not going to get it, you know. So uh, basically at that point, I had to, you know, admit that was a failed observation there. And so uh, things to avoid ops, trying to observe near the Clark belt, uh, you know, just not possible if you're sharing frequencies. Uh, you know, a larger dish with low side lobes would allow you to get closer, but still, I mean, you know, for demonstration, you want a small dish that you can easily pack in the car. Uh, the other possibility is I could have gotten an LNB that, uh, you know, went down to 10.7 gigahertz, and there's a narrow radio astronomy band there I could have used, but 
that's something I'm obviously not going to put together quick and, uh, you know, kind of takes away from the simplicity of the whole thing. Okay, so we had a future problem for the IBT uh, that uh, Starlink down frequencies are 10.7 to 12.7 gigahertz. I looked that up. And when I've been doing observations, just every once in a while, I would see some something go by, a sudden very large increase in signal strength. And it was going by quick, so it was obviously low Earth orbit something. And it was just very occasionally. But I'm kind of wondering, will that become more of a problem when Starlink gets more satellites up there and you get, you know, literally thousands of users all, you know, the satellites are transmitting down to them. So that's a possible problem for the uh, IBT for the future. Bruce, yeah. the IBT is the Itty Bitty Telescope. Oh, that's okay. Right. That's the uh, uh, Itty Bitty Telescope. It's a telescope built out of a uh, old dish network, single feed, uh, you know, dish that you picked up out of the uh, uh, rubbish can. Uh, anyway, and another one that was, uh, you know, didn't work well, uh, you know, same event, the partial eclipse that I was going to try to uh, get. And, uh, you know, I looked at uh, 408 megahertz with, uh, that's a, uh, uh, essentially like a twin quad ham antenna in front of a, a, a sheet reflector, a chicken wire. And, you know, you could see that I had a pretty lousy, uh, you know, thing there. It's all, you know, jagged, uh, you know, very jagged lines across there, which is uh, not too cool. And with subtracting the two, you could yeah, sort of see the effect of the eclipse, but that was not what I would call a good observation there. So then I took a look, well, what does the antenna see, you know? I just set the thing up and carefully lined it up so that it was pointed where it needed to point. It didn't take a careful look at the background. Well, we can take a look there. We can see you know, looking through the antenna, you pull the antenna out of the way. Well, what is the antenna see in this power pole here? And that was making all kinds of, uh, you know, reflections. And I should have learned that from some previous experience, but sometimes people learn slow being people. So anyway, that was a reflector, uh, you know, signal from the sun scattering it off of uh, all of the wires and stuff there. Uh, not good. So that was a rather poor observation. You got to say, you know, don't look at what you see looking there. What does the antenna see? Because it's a considerably different wavelength than your eyes, and it sees things very different. Then I had an episode with a 38 megahertz phase switch interferometer. It had uh, two active dipole antennas, and, you know, they were just built kind of as a breadboard uh, kind of things there. And I threw a plastic bag over them for a, a raincoat, and that had virtually no effect at 38 megahertz on that. And assorted stuff makes up a receiver. By the way, that's a little scanning receiver, about 15 kilohertz bandwidth, and a phase switch mechanism for a phase switch interferometer. And, uh, you know, uh, summing uh, yeah, down here, that's uh, summing the signals together and running it to that receiver. I had used that same arrangement with the scanning receiver turned to 408 megahertz and different preamps and antennas on it it was actually able to easily detect uh, Cygnus A, Cas A, and the sun. You know, so I figured I could get something. Well, you know, really didn't work too well. You know, by the way, part of the uh, processing for the phase switch interferometer is done with a uh, uh, software lock-in amplifier I did. I'm not really much of a software guy, but I did manage to produce that. A little help from my kid who's a software guy. But anyway, taking a look at what I saw there, uh, one of the things I do when I'm looking at uh, interferometer is I, I'll draw across there. I'm, in my case, I'm using Excel that a lot of people curse. But anyway, I tend to use it. And you can quite easily make a graph across there. That's just the fringe rates for the various things. So I know roughly what I'm looking for. find that helpful. But you know, I can't see anything resembling those uh, fringe rates in there. And, you know, uh, you had uh, Cygnus A going through there and uh, Cas A going through there and would have thought I would have, uh, you know, had something on it. Not, you know, nothing, but the, you know, just a lot of garbage there. Uh, I took a look later. Uh, this was when, you know, over a longer period of time, kind of uh, driven by curiosity. You can see there's times when, you know, nobody's home. You know, nobody's home. Nobody's home. That way we're out just briefly, but uh, anyway, but quite. But notice that was a more consistent. So I said I had a lot of level from uh, 
uh, LED lighting, among other things. So I found, I found 38 megahertz. There's a lot of things that make trash there. Uh, one of the things we've got is that uh, FCC has their emission standards. As Kent mentioned, they're not particularly useful for protecting things. And I call 30 to 60 megahertz uh, uh, almost a no man's land for RFI. I, I, of all things in my career, I designed some LED lighting supplies. I are my, make my own curves. But anyway, uh, I call that kind of a no man's land because they run conducted emissions up to 30 megahertz. And then from 30 and above, they run radiated. Well, a lot of things are too small to be much of a radiator between 30 and 60 megahertz, but yet they're only measuring conducted emissions, and you can actually have something that produces quite a bit of trash there. And when I was doing power supply design, a consultant that I worked with said, you always test your conducted emissions all the way up to 100 megahertz or so. Uh, and if there's any there, you may have trouble fix them, you know, was his thing. But anyway, that is kind of a no man's land as far as the uh, FCC is concerned and uh, well, and us basically. Okay, so then I did an analysis of uh, that whole thing there. And let's see if I can get this. I said, okay, CAS uh, A uh, uh, 38, uh, and it's the stronger of the two, uh, 38,000 Janskis. I mean, you know, that's a pretty strong signal. I was detecting something uh, you know, less than a tenth of that at 400 megahertz with similar arrangement. Uh, okay, so lambda, 7.9 meters, and a dipole over a ground plane kind of thing, uh, which I've got the ground underneath this active dipole. Uh, so that would be roughly 5, point, uh, uh, 5 dBi gain or 3.16 ratio. Uh, now, the antenna gain will actually be a lot lower than that but the pattern of it is almost the same as a dipole for the active dipole, and that's what actually counts there. But uh, uh, yeah, the galactic plane noise is basically your interference there. But anyway, then I took, okay, what's the active area of the antenna there, A sub E? And uh, you know, came out, uh, it's 15.7 square meters. And I said, well, what's the temperature rise of the antenna due to Cas A? And I went uh, down here and took a look at my, ah, I went too far down. What I do there? How do I undo that? Just click, just click on it. It'll go away. Uh, there. Okay, it won't go quite that low. But anyway, so I, I went that, and that uh, uh, the number of Janskis uh, times the uh, area in square meters. That 1380 is a number that if you take Boltzmann constant and divide it by the definition of a Jansky, you turn up with uh, you know, you know, the 1380. And then the times two is because this is a single polarization and uh, the, all the catalog things in Janskys assume you have both the power of both polarizations. So you divide by two on that. But anyway, now let's evaluate receiver sensitivity. Uh, now here we've got a T cis basically of 20,000 Kelvin. And the reason for that is the galactic background at 38 megahertz is very strong compared to you know, higher frequencies. And that took all my bandwidth of my receiver, 15,000 hertz, not a great bandwidth, but uh, uh, yeah, it's what I had available in a quickie setup. Okay, 10 second uh, integration time is about the longest it worked well with the uh, uh, software lock-in amplifier. And then that alpha of two, a phase switch interferometer, because you're not looking at the sky 100% of the time because of the switching process, that results in uh, uh, another loss of two. So I turned up 82 uh, you know, ke uh, Kelvin is about the limit of where the receiver uh, sensitivity is. However, that 82K is a standard deviation of the temperature fluctuation. Everybody takes that radiometer equation and says, that's my sensitivity. And in fact, that's not at all true that you got to multiply. You need at least three to five standard deviations of your source going through there to see it above the random fluctuations due to the you know standard deviation of the noise. So, uh, uh, you know, when you take 82K and multiply it by three or five, you get, you know, 250 to 400K roughly there. Cassiopeia is 900, uh, excuse me, 200K. So that was kind of another failure thing that uh, if I would have analyzed in advance, I would have said, you know, the chance of getting this, unless I use more bandwidth and longer integration time, I'm not going to get it. 
And then all the interference added on top of it, it left it a really unworkable situation. And then another thing that didn't work too well, I was uh, looking for uh, uh, 20 megahertz uh, you know, area signals. Uh, uh, I've got my kind of own uh, version of uh, Radio Joe, Joe where I'm using a, uh, a receiver from AirSpy instead of the uh, SDR play thing. But anyway, so I've got you know, 20 megahertz SDR and that uh, uh, it actually feeds quite nicely into the uh, uh, radio spectrograph from uh, Jim Sky and crowd. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, yeah, okay, uh, EMI at those frequency ranges, that seemed to be the real limit on seeing things. Computing devices, they're everywhere. They put out a lot of garbage at 20 megahertz. Uh, LED lighting and other things with switch mode power supply, cell phone chargers, you know, arcing hardware, electric fences, uh, uh, you know, arc welders. Uh, you know, uh, in one case, a lightning storm that was 600 miles away was my source of interference. Uh, one of the more interesting ones was a cordless line, uh, landline uh, telephone. I still use the landline some, and uh, yeah, the cordless phone. The old one, the uh, buttons on it finally died. It was still working good as long as you push the buttons hard enough. So I went and bought another one, uh, you know, same brand, another Panasonic, put it on there. And uh, it just absolutely wiped out uh, 20 megahertz area. And I thought, well, what is going on with that? And I started uh, going after, uh, you know, chunks of ferrite everywhere and got a, a ferrite. Well, in one case, I was working with a ferrite of unknown origin, but uh, those can actually be useful. And we'll talk about that in a few seconds there. But uh, anyway, uh, I did put uh, two common mode chokes, which are another thing of unknown origin off of a scrap power supply together and put those in the phone line. Not quite FCC 68 approved, but I had to go through that approval process and knew that was uh, you know safe, wouldn't damage their equipment. So yeah, sneak around the law a little bit there. Uh, but, uh, anyway, uh, that helped a whole lot in the ferrite sleeve on the power supply. I needed both of them to get there. Uh, just one of them wouldn't get it. Uh, okay, now we're going to talk about, you get all these things of unknown origin. A chunk of ferrite came off of a computer cable. You know, I'm not the sort that throws things away. I'm a real junk salvager. I think probably a few of us here are probably about like me, uh, sal salvage it, it might be useful. So the thing for testing those, let's see if I can get my thing. I built up a, a box. This had uh, a good quality tea in it, nothing like a good cup of tea occasionally, but the leftover box put a couple of BNC connectors, a couple of alligator clips and a wire across there. And you put the chunk of ferrite on there. And then you basically network analyzer. In my case, I was just using a fixed frequency signal generator and an RF power meter, and you measure it and get a few, I put a 10 ohm resistor on each side because I found that left it more workable in the impedance area where I was working. And uh, then worked out a little graph using some, uh, you know, spice simulations of the whole thing and measured it with a few just physical resistors there at a match. So I've got a graph here that tells me how much loss that has at a particular frequency. And you're really wanting to get something that has, uh, you know, 20, 30, uh, or, or even 40 dB loss in there if you have a thing making noise. And uh, so if you get a ferrite, put it on there, it has no effect at your frequency of interest. You know that that's for a very different frequency range. And I did find one chunk of ferrite that was marked as Siemens N30, which you could actually put it on here and you couldn't tell it was there for signal level. It was a low frequency ferrite that was at a very high permeability at, you know, out to a few kilohertz. And after a hundred kilohertz, it went away. So even though it looks like a gray ferrite, like everything else, it was actually worthless for any uh, RFI thing. So, uh, Crew little box uh, for that, to uh, test that is a useful thing to test all these things of unknown origin. And the common mode chokes, I just put them across the uh, uh, thing there uh, so that the coils are in series here. So there's a DC path from here to here. And again, you can see the two chokes that I had, they were very effective at 20 megahertz. And I did find some chokes that were effective at lower frequencies but not at 20 megahertz. So that allowed me to sort through the uh, uh, ferrite chokes that I had in my uh, scrap box. You put the lid on the box. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I found out that later the lid on the box 
wasn't necessary because, you know, unless the frequency you're testing at has a local signal there, you can do it without the lid. But, uh, you know, initially I was putting the lid on and I realized, oh, putting the lid on makes very little difference. So I ended up doing most of my testing with the uh, lid off. Unless it's a very large attenuation, you might see some background stuff. But, uh, you know, more reasonable ranges of attenuation you're going to get. Uh, get away with leaving the lid off. There's a... Uh, you know, different things. I, I used a 1976 vintage uh, signal generator there and a 2005 vintage uh, power meter that came as a uh, kit from, I think, KA7EXM uh, made those, uh, you know, kits. They were available uh, through an article in QSD. But anyway, that proved very effective for uh, simple stuff. And I do my testing at 13 and 26 megahertz. And the reason for using those two frequencies, is I could do an observation at 20 megahertz at the time and not, you know, not bother it, uh, even if the lid was off the box. And the generator, the turning the band switch would uh, back and forth would move between those two frequencies. So anyway, that was a rather crude. You could easily uh, go more like 2020 to, you know, modern vintage and get one of the little uh, uh, mini VNA things uh, and uh, do very effectively at that also. Okay, here's some of my unknown filters of unknown origin that, uh, you know, did some uh, testing on there. You know, you get things like a little board like this that came out of a power supply, and uh, that was reasonably effective. Uh, by the way, chokes that I found that work better in the 20 megahertz area, I don't know if you can see it, but the windings here are uh, wound as two sections. They wind a sectional winding, and then they go a little further down. Uh, spacer and then another section of the same winding. And the purpose of that is to make the uh, uh, frequency range of it go up. And uh, yeah, I'm losing my cursor. And uh, some chokes were less effective. These, This one and this one were pretty good at 20 megahertz. This one were you know, marginal. And this over here was uh, you know, not much good. There was good for higher frequencies. And then you get these power line filters that are sometimes in stuff and come out of boxes. Uh, yeah, those turned up to be uh, useful later. But anyway, I do have a way to test these things of unknown origin. Uh, ah, electric fence. I uh, have a garden out there. Uh, uh, you know, deer, you know, really uh, love uh, sweet potato plants. You sweat, plant your sweet potatoes and the deer come out there and devastate them. And turned up a two-level electric fence was necessary to persuade them to get out a single level they jump over. And if there's two fences, they uh, don't jump over for whatever that's worth. But anyway, you got the fence charger. In order to find out if the fence charger was working, I have a little loop of wire there on the ground side that I just push near it and see if I got a spark to quick test on it. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, I essentially found no EMI from that. If the insulators are clean and there's no weeds touching, you get a weed touching it every second or whatever period of time, there's this you know click in your data. So uh, uh, anyway, uh, you know, keep the weeds off of me if you have to keep the deer out of your garden. Okay, computer in the uh, office, the other end of the house was noisy. And I turned on early morning when there's a lot less noises and I went around the house and turned on various uh, LED lighting and didn't really find anything that was wrecking 20 megahertz, interesting enough of all the uh, uh, LED lighting, although some of it was wrecking 38, so. Yeah, you figure. But anyway, 20 megahertz did not show up on the uh, antenna there. But I went across and did turn the computer on in the office and all of a sudden uh, got all of this noise here. And, a, and that's a level above what you see from Jupiter emissions. Uh, you know, sometimes they're pretty weak and uh, or, or even weaker solar emissions. You could cover them up. And I did things like, uh, you know, pulled the network cable off because I'm using a uh, uh, regular uh, RJ45, uh, you know, Cat5 uh, cable network there. And pulling it off caused a pretty good drop in the level. Plug it back on, noise is back. And the computer's done booting up, so it's making a little less noise. Pull it off, noise goes away, back on. You know, I could definitely see that, you know, the network cable was a big part of the uh, noise problem. So again, computer noises, uh, you know, they can mess up your observations. Uh, so I ended up at... Uh, uh, getting some uh, ferrites, which I uh, yeah, got that that's mentioned in my paper, the uh, and uh, where I got them from Digikey. Uh, 
couple dollars a piece for each donut. They're expense much more expensive than Krispy Kreme, but that Krispy Kreme doesn't work on cables. Uh, ah, back up. Went ahead there. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, the particular ferrites, uh, the, the Cat 5 cable, I got a ferrite that had a big enough window that the Cat 5 uh, RJ45 connector could just go through there so I could get three turns through the core and three turns provided you're not getting capacitive effects will actually give you nine times the impedance of a single turn. So it really cuts down noise a whole lot. And uh, you can see this was actually the one at the cable modem side. And I had a, a, a ferrite there over the power cord to the cable modem and the uh, you know uh, network cable coming up there I actually had uh, one on both ends of the patch cable going down to the wall before I finally got rid of it totally. So there was four of those ferrites between the cable modem and the computer before everything was uh, quiet. So it's a noisy world with that. Okay, so the computer is considerably less noisy after taking all those measures, although I can still take a look and I can see that the Computer is on. I have some kind of background noise that's there all the time. I don't know what it is, but you can still tell when the computer was turned on, but nowhere near as much. So I've still got some work there to get it because I had seen Jupiter emissions near that level a couple times. So uh, it's, uh, you know, you go after all the noise you can kill. Okay. Ah, then I had some LED shop lights that I got. They were nice four foot long. They looked like, uh, fluorescent fixtures, but there were tubes full of LEDs, really nice light fixtures, got them at uh, Costco or whatever, put them on there. Well, when they're turned on, you can see what they look like on their uh, uh, thing there. It's a pretty noisy uh, source there. And these things had a two wire power plug on them and a metal shield behind the lights that reflecting that was just floating. And floating metal can sometimes uh, cause you some uh, headaches on that. So anyway, I had a bunch of these fixtures around. So I went and, uh, you know, first I took it apart because that there's nothing I don't take apart to find out how it works. You know, so I took it apart and looked. They actually have in there two separate switching regulators, one for each tube, and they run it almost but not precisely the same frequency. So that probably helps them on FCC 15, but it doesn't help you on interfering with, uh, you know, our stuff. So anyway, some of those line filter blocks like Corcom or whoever makes, uh, uh, bolting those on and bringing a three wire power plug there. And that silenced those down to the point where you couldn't tell when the light fixtures were on. That one, I took a uh, one that had a power cord plug in line filter, but again, that fixed it. So those line filters were very effective for that. So watch the uh, LED lighting fixtures. Like I said, that one just, totally wiped out 20 megahertz when it was on. And I had four four or five of them around. I you know, ended up taking my junk box pretty good to find enough uh, filters for that. And uh, okay, here's some interference from a, a weak solar burst that's kind of in there. You can uh, see up in here, there's some, uh, uh, a little bit there. And other people that were watching at the same time saw a noticeable solar burst there, but it wasn't a real strong one. And uh, uh, Dave Chapinski uh, was the one that came along and there said, oh, I know what all of that is. He said, he looked at a weather map at the same time I was observing. And there was lightning storms there. And I'm up right here. So that's right in the area where uh, F layer ion ionosphere reflection will send it in. The sun's coming in at a high enough air angle that it goes through the ionosphere. But this stuff at low angles, I mean, uh, the, these storms were in the perfect place. And, so Dave assured me that was lightning storms and there was a source of it. So it is another thing out to get you. Okay, it's kind of a short list of things that didn't work and, uh, you know, kind of my, you know, failures. And, uh, you know, if, if I wanted to tell you everything I built that didn't work, we'd be here all day and everybody would be really tired of my voice by, by much longer than now. So hopefully it's a bit more on how to make things manageable and hopefully some people will know how to salvage uh, you know, filters out of scrap power supplies and stuff. Uh, one of the advantages, if you uh, want a filter, you have a scrap power supply, it's the wire cutters, and five minutes later, you have it at hand. You go to DigiKey, Mauser, or you know, Aero, any of the electronic distributors, 
well, uh, unless you pay overnight shipping in this area, I get a, need a couple of days to get it. So yeah, that's kind of where we stand there. And by the way, I call my observatory the Vulture's Roost Observatory. You can see my ham antenna is a very popular uh, place on it uh, here and there for vultures. And, you know, maybe it's attracted to projects that died or didn't quite work right. <laughs> yeah, every observatory needs a name, Vulture's Roost. The <laughs> okay. So anyway, any questions? And I could be reached at my hand call is probably the easiest one to remember, NT4RT. That's uh, November Tango 4 Radio Telescope at ARRL.net. So that's probably the easiest email address to remember. And questions, comments? Other observations that could add to it? I got the clip of the uh, 20 megahertz telescope that was used by Tom Clark back in the 1970s for his doctorate thesis on 20 megahertz from Jupiter. And oh. It was quite a phased array, about uh, 200 yards long and about 100 yards wide. Oh. Okay, well, you know, I'm calling my... Uh, I'm calling my antenna, antenna rather than the you know BLA or large array, call it the back garden array. <laughs> and ultimately, I'm going to have uh, two, maybe three of these uh, active dipoles in there. And by the way, I found that the active dipoles, active dipoles uh, for receiving in places where you're limited by the galactic background noise, I mean, you know, the gain of your antenna is uh, you know minus 15 dBi. Uh, if the background noise is covering you up, up your receiver noise anyway, that's good enough. And the pattern of the antenna is what uh, counts there. So anyway, I'm doing further work on those and we'll be hopefully publishing a little more on that in the uh, you know, uh, future. Uh, I have found that it was very good for watching solar bursts, just the single antenna that I've got up now. And I'm experimenting on better preamps and other things. So we'll see how that goes. And so... Thank you, everybody, for putting up with my voice for a few minutes here. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we're going to eat lunch.